How y'all doing? Oh, man. Ooh. I almost spilled my water. All right. You want to hear a story? Yeah. All right. Uh, so I went on a hunting trip this week. You still want to hear the story? Uh, how dare you think? <laughs> so um, I went, it was a hog hunting trip. So it was, uh, it's actually, it was, uh, it, was, it was a public service um, because pigs all over the country are destroying farmland. So I'm just looking out for farmers. Um, so don't hate me. But also they taste good. So anyway, um, I was on a trip and, and uh, we left on Thursday and uh, it was just this one, it was a, it was a one day, one night hunt kind of deal. And so we go in and uh, you ever watch Swamp People? So this is the swamps of North Carolina. So just take the Louisiana, like take the, take the Creole draw out of the accent. And those are the people that I'm hanging out with. Um, the, it sounds just as country. And so we go down there and and uh, we're, we're just, we're where the were- werewolves live. And um, we, they, they're like, all right, we're going to set you up in this, in this box stand, you know? And uh, I was like, okay. So in the hunting world, if you get a box stand, like you're living large, because what a box stand typically is, is it's this big fiberglass box that you can sit in the chair and you got windows all the way around, right? And it's big and nice. And some of them are even a little, you know, some of them, even have fans in them and all this stuff. Like it's a, it's a cool setup and it's elevated on this big metal tripod and you look at it and you go like, all right, like it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like when you hunt in a box stand, it's kind of like people who say they're going camping, but they have an RV. You know what I mean? It's not the same. Uh, so I'm like, sweet, man. Like I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be great. You know, I came here last time. I was on a big metal tripod. They've upgraded. They got, they got walls around it. I'm going to be able to walk around. I'm going to be able to look around. It's going to be awesome. I get there and it's a three by three plywood box with three windows on it, a door that's about 18 inches tall. And the ladder, I looked at it and took one look at it and went, I'm gonna break that. <laughs> like, this is not safe, this is insane. So I go to climb in and I'm like squeezing my way in, you know, like, like, it's, like it's like I'm being rebirthed getting into this thing. And, um, and I, I don't fit, you know, this was not built for fat guys. It was confirmed later because the guy who built it is five foot eight and 165. And I was like, yeah, it sounds about right. And so I, I, I get in there and I, I can't, I, I get my head in and I look up and I can't, like, how am I going to fit through this hole? But also there's a desk chair in here. It, there's a desk chair. I'm sitting in a desk chair to hunt. Super weird. Here's the other thing. Anybody ever sat in a desk chair and it was silent? No. They creak. So I'm sitting in this chair and I'm like trying to get comfortable. And every time I move, I feel like the woods are just hearing me and running away. Like it's just, it's terrible. And I, and like if you lean back too far, the, the fake, the plastic leather, it, it would, it would touch the plywood and squeak like just super loud. So I'm like, what am I going to do? This is terrible. Like and then the next thing I know, I'm looking around and I'm thinking about this stand and I'm like, man, this is so redneck. And then I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I think to myself, how did they get this chair in here? There's not a single hole in this box big enough to fit the chair. So apparently they were so sold on the idea that this chair was a great idea that they took it apart to put it into the uh, stand. And so we, we hunted, hunted till like, I don't know, 1.30 in the morning or whatever. The, 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 the hogs are not regulated. They're a, they're a nuisance animal. And so uh, you really can, it, it, it really kind of is a little bit of a public service because the state would pay people to, to try to uh, do what hunters do. Um, and so the, it, we were sitting in there and there's nothing and I didn't see, I didn't, I didn't see anything. Uh, so we get out and it's like one in the morning and it's cold and whatever and um, stayed in a hotel to come home and then I get home and I had been gone for two days. So I'm like, man, I told you all the stuff about the hunt just to tell you about the redneck box. The real story is coming. So just so you know, that had nothing, it had no value whatsoever, but I wanted you all to know how crazy that was. Anyway, uh, so I, I, I get home and I mean, it's like, Hey, I'd like to work out. And like, I've been gone for two days. So it's like, okay, yeah, definitely. Like, let me just grab the girls. And, and so I grab them and I, have, I had gone to this store and bought a bunch of meat since I didn't kill anything. I needed to have meat to eat. So 
uh, I bought it. And uh, I, so I have a cooler full of meat. I got the two girls. And, you know, they, they're both at that stage where they feed off of each other. So if one starts crying, the other starts crying. And so I'm just trying to get in the house without anybody crying. And I'm in a hurry and everything else. And I, I bring them in. I got the baby sitting on the, on the freezer. I got Nora walking around trying to tell me how to take care of the baby. And I got, and I got this cooler. I put the cooler down. And there's something on my shoe. And I'm like, what is on my shoe? And I had just been at Target, so I figure. I probably just stepped in some gum in the parking lot, but you know when there's something on the bottom of your shoe and it keeps, you feel it, and you're just like, I can't stand this right now. Maybe I'm the only crazy one. But you're like, I can't stand this right now. So I'm like, okay, it's gum. I stepped on gum in the Target parking lot, and I reached down to, you know, to take it off like an idiot, and it moved way too easy to be gum. And I was like, I look at my hand, and, I, you know, I'm still 12 years old on the inside. I look at my hand and I'm like, and I immediately just start retching. Yeah, like, and Norris like, Daddy, what's wrong? And I'm like, it's poop, it's poop. And is a, I'm like walking out, trying not to throw up in my garage, which I didn't. Uh, but it was just, it was a mess. And uh, yeah, so I stepped in dog poop. I think that all too often, um, we walk around like we got poo on our shoe. I think a lot of times, you know, we're called to live freely. We're called to live in the freedom of Christ. We're called to be a people that, that, that set free from our sin, that set free from the things that hold us back. And, and we're, we're supposed to be the ones living the lives. We're supposed to be the ones living our best lives. Like that shouldn't be something we have to say. It's just something we do all the time, right? But more often than not, Christians go walking around like they got poo on their shoe. You know what I'm saying? You never thought you'd hear a pastor work poo in so well into a sermon, did you? We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. And this is really what Paul is talking about. So uh, Paul, Galatians is a letter written uh, to the church in Galatia. There we go, Galatia. I always, I'm, I'm always afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing. It's a letter written to the church in Galatia, and Paul writes this letter because what's happening in the church is that basically there's this group of people called the Judaizers, and we talked about this a little bit when we were going through Acts, but what they were, what they were telling the Galatian church is, hey, you have to abide by all the Jewish law if you want to be a Christian. So you, you, you have to do this. The, one of the big points of contention was circumcision, you remember, and and. And so you have to abide by all the Jewish law if you want to be a Christian. And this is a deterrent to the faith, but also um, it's, it's, it's just not true. And Paul writes this letter, and what he's saying is like, listen, you've been set free from the law by Christ if you live in the Spirit. So if you live with the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is in you, then you don't have to follow that law anymore because it won't be a problem because the Holy Spirit will keep you on the right trajectory. And, and, and you don't have to be restrained by all of those things we used to be restrained by. And, and this is a large part of the conversation in the New Testament when you read the epistles, when you read these letters that Paul and Peter and John write to the, to the churches. It's, it's a huge part of it. They're just saying like, hey, you can, you can live freely. But, but, but what happens then and what happens now is that we end up, we, 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 we end up on the extremes does that make sense? So we end up on the extremes. We tend to, we tend to do this thing where, where, where you know, we, I can live freely, I can live freely. And so you have certain people who, like, who focus on that, and they end up all the way over here. And, and what they're doing, basically, is they're saying, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, that doesn't work. Because what you want is messed up. That's how you got where you got in the first place. Right? And it doesn't work, but, but you, you, you'll have... You'll have that, and then on the other hand, you'll have these people that are, that are, that are legalistic, and, and they, they don't ever do what they want to do, right? They don't ever do what they want to do, and they, what, they end up, what they end up doing is, honestly, they, they end up spending their whole lives failing at behavior modification, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I say a cuss word if in my heart I still hate that person, right? Like, if I say it, that's probably rude. But if I don't say it and still feel the same way, I'm just as sinful, right? And so they spend their whole lives, they spend their whole lives 
attempting to mod- modify their behavior to be good enough. And, 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 and what you end up with is Christians that they walk around like they got poo on their shoe. And nothing's better. Nothing about the life, for a lot of us, nothing about the life we live is better than people who are doing whatever they want. Right? And, that, and that's why people wonder why you go to church. What about your life is better than mine in the first place? Right? So Galatians chapter 5, we're going to start in 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled following... Ooh, I just flipped into Ephesians. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what, it, what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with, with one another so that you are not to do whatever you want. But you are led, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, uh, pay, uh, forbearance. They change the word. They updated the NIV translation and they changed the word, and I keep wanting to say patience. Uh, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So what Paul is unpacking here for the Galatian church is he's saying exactly what we're talking about. You, you're called to be free. Not only can you be free, you're supposed to be, right? And, 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 and you're called to be free. You don't have to live by the law anymore. You're not under the law anymore, but you can't do everything you want to do. And this is the weird tension that we live in because as I'm talking to you, or if you've been in church for a while, as I'm talking to you a little, a little bit ago, you're, you're sitting there thinking, I hear what you're saying. I've had those same thoughts. But how do you do that? Because I need to be better, but I also need to be free. And that tension is just, it can be so confusing and so overwhelming. What's that even supposed to look like? I can tell you what it's not supposed to look like. When I was a little kid in Sunday school, I had a Sunday school teacher that told me if I hadn't asked for forgiveness for every sin in my life when I died, I'd go to hell, right? And so I spent every night going, I, I, every night I asked for salvation all over again because in my brain I thought, well, that one counts for all of them, so I'm going to just keep doing that, right? <laughs> it's not supposed to look like that. That's an extreme version, right? But it's also not supposed to look like doing whatever you want. So like how? How? The first, uh, the first thing that Paul points out here is you can live freely, but you're not to indulge your flesh. And that's, that, that part is about, it's about the disposition of the heart. Right? You can live freely, but I'm not to indulge my flesh. I think that at the end, uh, I think that it's about my heart being in the right place. I had a teacher uh, in college. His name was Wilbur Williams. And, and this guy was, uh, he was, I don't know, a million years old. And he was super old, like hung out with Noah old. Um, and and he, he, was, he was an Old Testament teacher, which, again, that's appropriate. He was that old. Um, and he, he was awesome. The class was basically like listen to him tell stories and hope you could pass a test. Like that was it. Like it wasn't like a curriculum. It was just like he was just like walking in and just shooting off the dome for two hours. 
and it was crazy, and he'd done it for forever. So you go in there, and he just talks, and he get off on these tangents, and one of the things that I started doing real early on in that class is I would take notes, but I never took notes on what he was teaching about the Old Testament. I took notes on the things that he said that were just amazing. He would say things that had nothing to do with the topic of the class that were just mind-bogglingly good. And one of the things that he said was, he said, you know, God's will, God's will is like a four-lane highway. A lot of people think it's a rope bridge and you kind of got to balance beam it, you know, and not fall off. Because if you fall off, you're not in God's will anymore and everything's going to fall apart. But he said, I, he said it's more like a four-lane highway and there's room to maneuver. There's room to maneuver inside God's will. God's not so small that he's got a singular plan for your life that you can screw up with one misstep. God's so big that he's got a four-lane highway plan for your life that you basically have to try to screw up on purpose. And, and so you can, you can maneuver inside of this highway. And if you want to leave God's will, you got to choose to get on the exit ramp and leave. Right? And so when he said that, I was just like, whoa. Whoa. So what does it look like to live freely but not indulge my flesh? What it looks like to live freely but not indulge my flesh is don't do the dumb stuff. Don't do the dumb stuff. There's stuff you have in your life that you know you're not supposed to do. You just know it. Don't do those things. Right? I'm not talking about behavior modification. I'm not talking about trying to, trying to, like, like trying to somehow create the fruit of the Spirit in your life. I'm saying there's a handful of things that God's put straight in front of your, in front of your face you know you're not supposed to do. Don't do those things. Don't do those things. They're the obvious ones. They're the obvious ones. You know, there's a, there's a little rhyme. You don't, 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 uh, don't drink, don't chew, don't date girls that do. Don't do those things. Right? Is, so Logan said that, you know, we're Wesleyans or whatever. It's part of the denomination that we came from. And, and uh, one of the jokes in the denomination is that Wesleyans live forever because they don't do anything that could kill them. They don't drink. They don't chew. They don't date, date girls that do. They don't do none of that. They live forever because they don't do anything that could kill them except eat bacon. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, and so, you know, like, it's, 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 it's like that. If I can eliminate the things that are straight in front of my face that are just dumb to do in the first place, that don't gratify me, don't gratify God, and don't gratify the people around me, if I can eliminate those things, you know what will happen? I'll stay in that four-lane highway. There are the dumb things that you know you aren't supposed to do. When you choose to do, do those things, you're choosing to make a move towards the exit ramp. Right? So... We live freely, but don't indulge the flesh. The next thing that Paul says here, and it's uh, starting in verse uh, 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I can live freely, but I can't indulge my flesh. And in my living freely, I can be confident that I'm in the will of God, but I can't be arrogant. You see, so in our culture right now, people automatically, like really quickly, will get labeled as, as uh, arrogant or cocky. That's something that, that ha you see somebody, like, like, you know, we're supposed to put things on Instagram that make us look like we're amazing, but then say things about ourselves in the caption that make us, that put ourselves down. <laughs> like, that's our culture. Like, we only share pictures of our highlights, but we write about our lowlights. That way people will compliment us, right? That's the, that's the way that, that social media works. I look awesome in this picture. I'm actually terrible. Now say nice things about me. <laughs> Am I wrong? That's what we do. And so people can be, people can get confidence and arrogance confused because someone who's confident is someone who just, they get what they're good at, they get what they're bad at, and they're not afraid to talk about it, right? Someone who's arrogant gets what they're good at, has no idea what they're bad at, and they talk about themselves all the time. <laughs> the difference between confidence and arrogance when you boil it down is selfishness. It's selfishness. 
And that's, that's it right there. You don't want, if, you, if you don't want to fall into acts of the flesh, what do you got to do? Eliminate the selfishness in your life. Eliminate the selfishness in your life. And that, that's, it's, it's pretty much that, that simple and that easy. You, you get rid of that and you're not going to be involved in all of the list of things that he listed off. Right? Sexual immorality. Selfish, because it's supposed to be a mutual act of love between two people. And when you're just using the other person as someone that will provide you pleasure and then you move on, that's selfish, right? Impurity and debauchery, basically getting drunk and being an idiot. Uh, selfish, nobody's ever liked a drunk person, except if they were drunk as well. If you're sober and you're around a drunk person, you want to hit them. It's just true, right? Right? Idolatry, selfish, you're making God in your own image. Witchcraft, selfish, you're making God in your own image. Hatred, selfish, because you're only thinking about yourself. You don't value the other person. Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, these are acts of selfishness. Selfish ambition, obviously selfish. Dissensions, factions, you're creating a group within the church to go against. You're creating a group within society to go against. We should be known for what we're for, not what we're against. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, selfish. If you can eliminate the selfishness in your life, then you can safeguard yourself from being so arrogant that you think that you can control God's plan for you. So I started out kind of putting down behavior modification, and then I told you how to modify your behavior. <laughs> Next thing I'm going to do is try to sell you a timeshare. You're not actually buying anything, but pay me. Um, we can never modify our, our behavior enough to be good enough for God. Because we're saved by grace and grace alone. And at the end of the day, it's about my heart. So how do I work on the little things, but keep my mind, keep my focus on the improvement of my heart? What does that look like? How do, how do I do that? Because this is what happens. When we, when we, if you can fix the little things, modify the, the be, you know, your disposition, your behaviors a little bit, but keep your focus on the heart, then, then, then you, can, you can grow. But if you turn your focus and you're only focused on the behavior modification, here's what happens. You become selfish. You become self-loathing. You don't really like being a Christian. You wonder what's it all worth in the first place, right? Because you need both. You need to be better, but you need Jesus. If you only focus on Jesus and never try to get better, you're not going to go anywhere. And if you only focus on getting better but never focus on Jesus, you're not going to go anywhere. So how do you do both? How do you figure that out? So my favorite baseball player is a guy named Tipper Jones. So this guy, he came into the major leagues like 94, 95. I started watching 95, 96. So I watched him most of his career. And the dude was really good. Um, he was one of the best switch hitters of all time. So a switch hitter in baseball is somebody who hits right-handed and left-handed. So depending on the pitcher, they'll choose whether they're going to hit right-handed or left-handed. And... Um, and so Chipper Jones, like, the dude averaged uh, 300 batting average for his whole career. So what that means is he hit 30%. He got a hit on 30% of his at-bats. In baseball, that's really good for a career average, especially if you play 18, 19 years. And um, he, did, he, he averaged 300. He had something like, he was something over 400 home runs, you know, over 1,500 RBIs. Basically, there was only one switch hitter in baseball that was ever a better hitter than Chipper Jones, and his name was Mickey Mantle. And so uh, Chipper played for the Braves. I was a Braves fan because we're from North Carolina. They don't have a North Carolina Major League Baseball team. But also, the Braves were on TV. Every game was on TV. It was on TBS because Ted Turner owned the Braves, so he put them on TBS all the time. So I was watching the Braves as a kid basically every night, and I loved Chipper Jones. He had this cool toe tap when he, when he would hit and it looked cool and he was just awesome right and so 
Um, I watched him all growing up and then he retired. And actually I was like weirdly sad when he retired because it was like a whole part of my life kind of just ended because I'd watched him for so long. And um, I was listening to a podcast not too long ago and they asked him, Chipper, what did you do when you got in a slump? Because for in baseball, the, the batter is at a distinct disadvantage to the pitcher. Because first of all, the pitcher has a selection of, a lot of them have a selection of anywhere from three to five pitches that they can throw. These pitches will curve, they'll drop, some of them go fast, some of them rise a little bit. They do weird stuff. And so if you're, a, if you're a batter, you have to watch the ball and try to figure out what pitch is coming your way. So the pitcher has a distinct advantage. Also, like you're swinging a 30 ounce wooden stick at a ball about this big. There's a million directions that can go even if you make contact. And so, the, the, you know, as a batter, you're at a st- distinct disadvantage. And so batters will get into slumps. Hitters will get into, you know, slumps. And some will last a really long time. Some will last a short time. And they ask him, what do you do when you get in a slump? And his response was, well, I just go back to the T. He said, the only thing in my life that's never lied to me is that baseball T. I put the baseball on the T and I try to hit it straight. That's all I do. I put the baseball on the tee and I try to hit it straight. It's my whole, that's, that's my whole approach. That's how I get out of a slump. I know if I can spend a couple hours, you know, and, and hitting the ball till my hands are raw and I'm hitting it straight every time, I'm going to come out of that slump, right? This is insane. This man was the first $100 million player in the major leagues. This man was the MVP of Major League Baseball in 1998. He's a beast, and he's using what four-year-olds use to play baseball. As a four-year-old, what do you do? You play t-ball, and you hit the ball off the tee. Why? Because you're not coordinated enough to hit the ball out of somebody's hand, right? So he goes back to the tee. I have to go back to basics. That's how I keep my eyes on Jesus. That's how I find the balance. You know, I I think a lot of us, we know what we're not good at. We know the things that we're not supposed to do. And sometimes we do them and it brings us down and it gets us all messed up. And it's so easy to be drawn into this goal of modifying my behavior to be good enough and and lose sight of Jesus. And, And at the end of the day, if I want to be able to do both, I have to keep my eyes on Jesus, which means I have to go back to the basics. So in the Christian faith, what are the basics? Jesus, uh, Paul says it right in this passage, you'll fulfill all of the commands by following this one, love your neighbor as yourself. What are the basics in Christianity? You love God first and you love people second. All too often what happens is when we get overwhelmed, when we get messed up, when we get tired, what's the advice people give you? You need to take some time and focus on yourself. What do you do when you focus on yourself? Do those things actually make you better? Because if it's anything like me, you sit down in clothes you'd never be seen in in public. (laughs) You grab the remote, you flip on Netflix, and you binge on stuff you would never want people to know you're watching. What about that helps you recover? What about that makes you better? What about that does anything other than leave you feeling like you wasted another day? You focus on yourself. Look, there's no such thing as good selfishness. Now, there are times when you need to take a minute and rest. I get it. I'm not trying to put you down. I know that stuff happens. It gets overwhelming. Why do you think I went hunting this week? I was just taking a minute. But here's the problem. We're not told to take a minute we're told to take forever. You can't always be in recovery mode. You can't always do that. And so, so, so you, you, you keep your eyes on Jesus. You go back to the basics. You don't stop and say, I need to fix myself. I'm gonna take some time and fix my behavior. I'm gonna take some time and learn how not to do this again. You say, I gotta look back at Jesus. And what does Jesus tell me to do? Love God, love people. If you want to be able to do both, you got to be able to keep your eyes on him and put yourself to work. 
You got to do both. So, did I even say the second point? Uh, yeah, live confidently, but don't be arrogant. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that stuff. I could have, there's a thing right there that shows me. I can read them off the back wall. I could have known that. So we have to live in this tension. We can't, we can live freely, but we can't indulge the flesh. We can live confidently, but we can't be arrogant. At the end of the day, what Paul's saying here is that the fruit of the Spirit is a result of living in tension between holiness and freedom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live in the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The fruit of the Spirit is a result of living in these tensions. I cannot be who I once was, but I can be free, and I can't let my freedom cause me to go back to who I once was. How do I do this, right? And the version that our sin nature takes us to is where, I, where we started this whole conversation. Our sin nature takes us to legalism and licentiousness, right? Licentiousness means you have license to do whatever you want, right? So our, 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 our sin nature drags us to the perverted version of these two extremes, right? And, 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 and the holy, the, 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 the righteous, the, the godly version of these two extremes is holiness and freedom, not legalism and licentiousness. So I need to be holy. I need to be set apart to become who God made me to become. But I need to be free because I'm called to be free and I'll never be who, I, I'll never be who I'm supposed to be if I'm not free. If I'm not free, I can't be set apart. How do I live in this space? Well, the good news is there's room to operate. God's will isn't a tightrope. The other good news is we can go back to the basics and Jesus makes that easy. Focus on other people. Focus on God, right? But when it comes down to it, it's a hard tension to live in. And in our, our, our minds make us want to try to just be better. I, I keep coming back to that because I think that's what we do. We just get in a place where we get so beat down. We get so beat down by expectations, internal expectations, external expectations. We get beat down by expectations. We get beat down by not meeting the, the expectations of who we think we should be, who other people think we should be. Dumb stuff happens. You say a bad word here, you do a dumb thing there. And we just decide that we have to fix it. And here's the thing, it's much easier to try to fix myself than it is to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus because I know what's going on in me so I can be drawn to this. And Jesus, he's real and he's there, but he's invisible. And he's not in this room with me that I can feel in touch but I can change my behavior. So we, we get drawn back into this. And here's the problem. We lose sight of the point because the fruit of the Spirit is not, it's not something you can create. The fruit of the Spirit is growth. Fruit is a result of growth. If you've ever planted something, there's a seed. You put it in the ground and that seed becomes a plant. And that plant, if it survives the deer, grows and starts to have flowers. And once those flowers are pollinated and everything happens that needs to happen, it starts to bear fruit. Amen. But when we look at the fruit of the Spirit in the Bible, we think we can manufacture it. We think we can become that if we just try hard enough. I can't become that. I can only be, only be given that because of my growth in the Spirit. So I have to keep my eyes on Jesus. Man, I'm, I'm uh, going to give you another sports reference. Sorry. Um, <laughs> anybody watch college football? There's a guy named Nick Saban. He's the head coach of the Alabama football team. 
Uh, I hate Alabama. I'm a Clemson fan. And Alabama's beat Clemson in the playoffs a few times. Um, and uh, they also are always good, and it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. Nick Saban, was, uh, he's been a coach in college. He's been a coach in the NFL. Everywhere he's gone, except for the Dolphins. Uh, he was bad at the Dolphins. Everybody's bad at the Dolphins. But everywhere he's gone, he's had success. He's had ridiculous success everywhere he's gone. And over the course of time, he's worked with amazing coaches. He worked with Bill Belichick, the Patriots. He's worked with all these amazing guys. And um, here's Nick Saban's thing. It's the process. Trust the process. Trust the process. Trust the process. You say it over and over again. And he literally has a process for his players that they go through. And if you do all of these things, then you will play well on, Sun on Saturday night. If you trust the process, you will play well on Saturday night. Don't ever think about the outcome. Don't ever worry about whether or not you're going to win the game. Do what you're supposed to do today, and you'll win the game tomorrow. And he's won, like, like six national championships that way. And he's got, that, they, Alabama had more players in the first round of the NFL draft last year than anybody ever had. That's, that's how good Nick Saban is, and that's how good the process is. 18-year-olds trust their football coach more than we trust our God because God gave us a process. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do these things, the rest will work out. If you do these things, then you'll be in the will of God. If you do these things, then you'll be able to live in the tension between holiness and freedom. You have to trust the process. God's given us a good process. Amen. And if we trust that process, we can be free. We can be free. And all of a sudden, our lives can look different. Our lives can look different. We won't be just as stuck as the next person. Why? Because we serve a God of orders, order and answers who cuts through chaos and gives me a process by which I can become the man he created me to be. It sounds really, really simple. And it's really, really not. Because my, my sin nature, my brokenness wants to screw it up all the time. But if I'm ever going to be able to take hold of his plan for my life and live in the fullness of Christ. I have to love God and love people. And then I'll stand in the middle between freedom and holiness and I'll be in the sweet spot. It's all about going back to basics. It's all about keeping it simple. Can I pray for you? God, we thank you for giving us Jesus so we can be free. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. And we just pray that you'd forgive us for not keeping our eyes on you. We pray that you would just, God, that you would remind us, that you would remind us that, that, that the process you've given us is simple. It may not be easy, but it's simple. And God, that, that, that when we get off track and when, we go, when we're all over the place, we... Just pray that you'd send us a reminder. For anybody who's in here today and, and is just bogged down, doesn't get it, doesn't feel loved by you, doesn't understand your plan, is stuck, and isn't free, God, I pray you'd send somebody along their way that'll show them how to be. God, I pray you'd move on their heart, open them up, and let them see the person that you put in front of them and that they would receive it. And ultimately, God, that we could all together be walking in your freedom. God, we thank you. Thank you for not treating us. We thank you for not treating us like we deserve. And we thank you for giving, you, giving us the opportunity to walk in your promises and in the fullness of your grace. Amen. Thanks for watching another inspiring message from the New Life team. 
We pray that the message you just heard inspires you to grow deeper in your love for God and for others. Here at New Life, that's why we exist. If you'd like to take a step to grow in that walk, click the link in the description and fill out the connection card. See you next time.